Today we are going to be concluding chapter 6 of the Megillah. And this comprises two verses. We're going to be studying verse 13, followed immediately by verse 14. Now before I begin the actual study of these verses, I want to make it very clear that these two verses are conjoined at the hip. They necessarily have to be studied together and the one follows the other. And here's how I'll prove it to you. Let's do a cursory reading. Verse 13. Vayisaper Haman. Haman relates or tells Lezeresh Ishto to Zeresh, his wife, and to all of his friends, those who love him. What does he tell him? All that's unfolded. So what's the verb so far? What's the verb in verse 13? Told. Yeah, Vayisaper. The second half of verse 13 is Vayomru lo chachamov, his wise people or advisors, Vizera Shishto and Zeresh's wife, said to him, Im Mordechai, if this Mordechai is from the seed of the Jews, Asher hachiloi salin full of fun of you have begun to fall before him, loy suchaloi, you will not be able to put up a fight, you're not going to be able to contend, kinofel tipel of fun of you will surely fall before them, before him. So what's the verb here? The first verb is, in the beginning of the Pasuk, Vayisaper. Vayisaper means he told. That's Haman. Haman told. The next verb is Vayomru, they said. Who is they? They is wise people, advisors, wife, they. So this is basically how you would define a conversation. There's two interlocutors. There's Haman and his wise people. He's doing the vayisaper, he's doing the telling, he initiates the conversation, and they're doing the responding, they're answering, vayomru, vayisaper, vayomru. So vayisaper, vayomru, which is the two halves of verse 13, the two, the two verbs here, the two action uh, words are talking about an action, not taken, not something done, but rather the action of speaking. It's a conversation. How does verse 14 begin? Verse 14 describes what's going on in verse 13. Odom midabrim. They're still conversing. Meaning the conversation is still at its fever pitch. Odom midabrim imo. They are still talking to him. He initiated. He said something to them. They responded and spoke to him. And now they're still in the middle of responding to him. And all of a sudden, the sorry say ha-melech Ahasuerus, the royal officers came, the king's officers came, Vayavhilu. They said, that's it, quickly, we have to go. Lahavi is Haman to bring Haman, Allah Mishta Asher Asa Esther, to the feast that Esther had prepared. So verse 13 describes their conversation. He initiates, he says something to them, they respond to him. And Oda Medabrim, verse 14, is not mutually exclusive. It's not after verse 13 ended, then the next thing we moved on to is verse 14, but rather verse 14 is an extension of verse 13. He starts a conversation, they start answering, it's the middle of a conversation. They're still talking to him, we gotta go. The eunuchs of the king or the offices of the king have arrived. So that's the first thing we could see very clearly is that there is a direct link between the two. And then from here we move straight into the, the, the next. This is pointed out by the Ibn Ezra, Dina Pshara, and others, Dina Pasha, they all mention this, this, this kind of connection. So I wanna, like put it out there, we have to understand why is verse 13 necessarily linked to verse 14. I understand one event happens after the other, but it seems that verse 14 is meaningful because it happened in the middle of verse 13. It was Oda Medabrim. It was when they were still talking. And what would have been if they would come to him after they finished the conversation? Why is it important for the Megillah to identify the exact timing here? It was in the middle of the conversation, then they came. Why? As they say in the Gemara's language, my benayu, what difference would it make? If it's just telling us what happened, when they arrived, it's seemingly irrelevant. It's what they said that's relevant. They said, Haman, it's time to go now. But the Megillah seems to be telling us something about the timing. So that's the first thing, first uh, little seed that I want to plant in your heads. Now, the next thing that I want to point out is that this whole narrative, the whole like, subplot of, of the bigger story begins... Back at chapter 5, verse 10. I want you to take a look. Go back to chapter 5, verse 10. Why does it begin here? 
because really this, this second part of this narrative, this particular subplot, begins after the first party. Haman leaves on top of the world. He can't get over his fortune. He is the most important man in the most powerful empire in the world. He is the number two person. He's second to the king alone. The queen makes a party. She invites one guest, Haman. He's like almost a third wheel in their marriage. He is as close to monarchy as one could possibly imagine. Now what happened? And then he saw Mordechai. And Mordechai didn't bow to him. And it ate up his, his intestines were being consumed. He couldn't stand it. And he was so angry. But he doesn't lash out. It's cold, scheming, calculating. But Yisapa, come on. Holds it all in. I'll get that Jew, he says. And the first thing he does when he comes home is, take a look in verse 10. What's the verb here? Again, two verbs. Haman's verb and the people's verb. It starts off with Haman. The first part of the Pasuk is Haman. So Haman is Vayisapak Haman. Haman restrains himself. The next verb is Vayishlach. Vayishlach means he sends for. And he sends for. We don't know who he sent for yet. But he sends for and Vayove. They came. Who came? Es Oyavav, All of his beloved friends. And Zeresh Ishto, And Zeresh his wife. So from this we can understand that since he sent and they came, that who did he send for? He sent for Zeresh, and he sent for Ovav. Which means Zeresh wasn't sitting around at home waiting for her husband to come home. She was a busy lady. She was the prime minister's wife. She was jetting all over the place and making a tumult and doing things. And Haman said, honey, I need to speak to you now. She said, okay, no problem. She stopped whatever she was doing, left her chief of staff behind. We gotta go. My big man is calling. Haman is calling. The Oyavav, his advisors, people who loved him. Probably busy people. They didn't sit around playing cards in Haman's house all day. Haman sends for them. This is very important. We need to have a strategy session right now. We need a brainstorm. Everybody comes. So it all begins where Haman was on top of the world, feeling as if he was invincible. And, so, and then he was angered, infuriated in fact, by Mordechai. Sends for everybody and they come. Okay. And now, Haman is back home again, and all we hear about is that he is Vayasaper. He's speaking. W what do you mean? He, he's, who's he speaking to? Well, obviously, he's talking to his wife and the people who love him. Why is it that in verse, chapter 5, verse 10, he had to call for them? Whereas here, in chapter 6, he just seems to slide home, and as we talked about, or slinked home is more like it, Haman nidchaf al slinks home, miserable, covered by excrement, stinking to high heaven, mourning for his daughter who just committed suicide, feeling horrible that he had to give Mordechai a bath and a haircut and lead him through the town, cry, being the, 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 the royal crier. And, and he comes home and everybody's there. Doesn't say anything about their arrival. They must have been there because of Ayasapar. He begins all the narrative that we are aware of is Haman's talking to them. We don't know of him calling for them, of him sending for them. How, how'd that work? And this is pointed out by the Dinah Pshara, the Manas Alevi, the Ibn Ezra kind of touches on this. This is, a, this is a major problem, like something's missing in the narrative. It only is logical and makes sense that if he had to call for them last time, he should have to call for them this time. So there's a glaring distinction. And by the way, that's the beginning of the subplot, and we're getting very near the end of the subplot. This begins with a strategy session, Haman and his advisors. It ends with a strategy session. The next thing we hear about is Haman being literally hauled off to the party, and then begins the next plot, Esther, the party, and Haman's eventual demise. So why, why is that? That has to be understood. A broader question may well be asked here. Why was Haman broadcasting this? What's he talking about this for? Hey, you'll never believe what happened to me today. Really, what happened? Oh, he doesn't even ask. Why did he tell them this? He, talk about, he talked about his chagrin, he talked about his shame, he talked about his, his horrible day. Why would he want to call everybody together, make a meeting of this? How much should wanna, you, we'd want to stay out of his way when he came home after a day like this? He probably had smoke coming out of his ears. He, it was a terrifying thing to cross his path. Why, why did he tell everybody? He, he had to, it's bad enough it happened, he had to talk about it too? And then, they, and then they answer. What did they answer? They said, oh, come on. You think you had a bad day? Ha! You don't even know what's coming. 
This is nothing. Let's pour some salt in your wounds. You seem pretty miserable. Life's going to get much worse for you. If you start to fall before Mordechai, <laughs> the greatest of abyss is not too low. Why would they even say that? Your, your, your beloved is smarting, hurting, suffering. Give him a hug, give him a kiss. Tom Humman, you're a great guy. We love you. Don't worry about it. I'm sure it was just a bad day. Tomorrow's going to be much better. Wait, you're going to a party tonight. Just go yourself, you know, get yourself a good shower, clean yourself up. Everything's going to be good. It's a bad day. Bad days happen to everybody. You're still on top of the world. I don't know. That's what I would do if I was Zeresh. So I would think if I was his advisor, if I was the chief of staff, I, 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 try to, I try to prop my guy up. And here they put him down. And they said to him, doom and gloom. You have no future. Why would they say that? The whole thing doesn't make any sense. And a little nuance that has to be talked about is the fact that in verse 13, things switch. They switch orders, and, and somebody seems to be missing, or somebody changed. Because in the beginning, Haman, who did he tell it to? In the Vayasapar, in the first verb, it's Vayasapar, he told, who did he tell? Zeresh and Ohavav. First Zeresh, then his beloved friends, his advisors. And then, in the response, Vayoyim Ruloi, when they told him, it's who? Chachamov, the wise people, and Zeresh Ishto, and then it's only secondary, his wife. So how come his wife, he told his wife first, she was more prominent, and then it came to responding, she is like stepping back, and somebody else is responding. He told or spoke to Ohavav, his lovers, the people who loved him, his friends, and they got, he got a response from Chachamov. Where'd they come from? In the beginning, we know when Haman came together, it says, Vayishtach Vayavi, who did he send for? Must be his friends and his wife, because they came. as Ohavav Ishto. He sent for his friends and for his wife. Interestingly, here he sends for his friends first, not his wife. And by Yisaper, if you go back to verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, the last time he told them, he was telling about his glory and his greatness and how everything is fantastic. And Haman said, you wouldn't believe who was at the party, just me. But I can't stand it. So Haman first called his lovers, first called his friends, then he called his wife, but who responded first? Zeresh. He called for her second, but she spoke first. Now, he calls for her first, and she speaks second. And anyway, he started off with friends, people who loved him. He's, that was the first time, the beginning of the subplot. He begins to speak to people who love him, but who responds? Chachamov, the wise people. Where the wise people come from? Something here is not adding up. Which leads us to the obvious conclusion that this is one of those verses that contains a much deeper story. There's much more than meets the eye here. There's something very, very profound and that's being conveyed to us in the subtleties of these verses, and these verses have to be studied very, very carefully so that we should be able to appreciate and understand the big picture and the rest of the story. Okay, so with this preface, let us now try to understand the messages that are being conveyed to us, the story that's being told in these concluding verses of chapter 6. Let's take it from the top. Haman relates. He relates the story. He's telling the story. Why is he telling the story? He's telling the story to Zeresh. He's telling the story to Ohavav. Why would he tell them the story? Because he, because he needs some encouragement. He needs them to say, it's going to be good. He calls for his wife. <laughs> And it's going to be fine. So gesund. And what does he tell them? Eskol asher karahu. Everything that happened. Now this word karahu is a very, very important little word. Because karahu does not just mean what happened, but karahu shares a root with the notion of happenstance. You know, stuff happens. It happens. Murphy happens. Stuff happens usually means... Not that this is a long, drawn-out strategy, uh, some kind of choreographed story. Stuff happened! Wh 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 why are we emphasizing that? Haman's great-grandfather, Amalek, attacked our nation just when we were leaving Mitzrayim. We read about that on the Shabbat prior. And it says, When the narrative is given, it says, Who happened upon you? They didn't happen upon us. 
That was a very, very carefully planned attack. They are the original terrorists. They knew they couldn't win. The, the nation of Israel was invincible. God just defeated the mighty Egyptian army. They thought a ragtag band of guerrillas is going to be able to defeat the God that was able to vanquish the entire Egyptian army? What, because there was no Yamsuf? Because there was no sea in the desert? There's, there's a limitation to God's ways. They had no intention of winning. What they want to do? They wanted to demoralize the Jewish people. The terrorist can't win. The terrorist knows he can't win. But the terrorist is going to launch an attack on, on the United States, Chas Shalom on Canada. They're going to win. Did the 9 11 terrorists think they're going to bring the United States to its knees? They wanted to demoralize. They want to demoralize the Western world. They want to take away the Western world's joy. They want to create a sense of, 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 of eventual depression, sadness, while they wax euphoric. And their long term goal eventually is by draining the West of its exuberance and excitement, of its passion, of its joy of life, that eventually, with attrition, they slowly but surely eat away at the foundations of freedom. By the way, unfortunately, they're doing pretty well because they voted their people into power already and the attack on democracies around the world is rat ratcheting up. And of course, they, they, they know that they can always rely on anti-Semitism. It's always beneath the surface where the anti-Semites hate the Jewish people more than they hate themselves. More than they love themselves, pardon me. So therefore, they'll destroy themselves in their fit of anti-Semitism, just as Haman destroyed himself in his fit of anti-Semitism, as we learned in previous classes, had he not done this foolish act of going to Ahasuerus and saying, Hey, Ahasuerus, I need you to let me go and take care of the Jewish people. Nothing would have happened. All these problems happened. Haman brought the problems upon himself. Why? Blinded by hate. Because he was so obsessed with Mordechai, instead of waiting another few days, where he could have done this on his own, he went to Ahasuerus and all this went wrong. So there's two opinions of, in the commentaries as to what happened here. According to some, Haman was sent off by his wife and by his friends on a mission. When was he sent off? In the wee hours of the morning. They were up partying all night. And the mission was, go to Ahasuerus, get permission to hang Mordechai. And the anti-Semites, this Nazi party of people, was sitting there celebrating, drinking beer and zvushed and, so, and waiting for the big moment when Mordechai gets hung and they get to celebrate that. Strange thing. Haman's not coming home. They're waiting and waiting and waiting and hours and hours and hours go by and he's not coming home. And nobody wanted to leave. The suspense was so thick you can cut it with a knife. And finally, towards the end of the day, Haman walks in. He's covered with filth. He stinks to the high heavens. He's profoundly miserable and unhappy. And, and they're like, Haman? And he says, oh my God, you'll never know what happened today. What, where's Mordechai? Aren't we going to hang him now? We all stayed around for the party. And so, Vayisaper, Haman tells them the story. So from this perspective, now we understand why does the story begin now? Because they were waiting for him. This subplot begins back in chapter 5. By Yishlach Vayovay. He told them about his greatness. I can't stand this Mordechai. They hated the Jews as much as he did. They said, we have an idea. Yasu eats Gavaya Chamishamama. They said, make a gallows 50 cubits high. And then, Uva Boiker, in the wee hours of the morning, Emer the Melech, you'll tell the king, and we'll hang Mordechai, and everything is going to be great. And then you can come to the party happy. Mordechai will already have been hanging from the treetops, from his very tall tower. The whole city will see Mordechai hanging, and you're going to have a great end of the story. Party A was great. He got you really nervous, that Jew. Don't you worry. We're going to get rid of that Mordechai once and for all. Now Haman comes back, and a lot of things have gone under the water since then. Ahasuerus couldn't sleep. How was Haman to know that? He asked them to write the real royal chronicles. They ended up reading what Haman never knew existed and Ahasuerus never wanted read. But there's a God. And this is where Tak this is where the miracle starts to unfold. They try to turn the page. Ahasuerus says, go ahead, turn to the pages. Go back. What does it say over there? They quickly erase what's written. An angel rewrites it. And so they hear the story of Mordechai. And now the king says, Mordechai, what's going on here? Maybe that's what Esther wants. He doesn't know what's going on. He says, we never dealt with that. 
And as he's thinking about this, and as he's starting to ruminate on the fact that Haman seems to be a little too close to his wife, and starts to be suspicious that Haman is maybe trying to launch some kind of rebellion against him, or he's trying maybe to usurp his throne and steal his wife, and he has these thoughts in his mind. And who walks in the door? Haman, having no clue that Ahasuerus is infuriated and suspicious with him, thinking that he's coming to his buddy. And he says, I have something to talk to you about. And Ahasuerus says, wait, I have something to talk to you about. Oh yeah, what's that? And he, Ahasuerus says, Suppose there was somebody I wanted to honor. Give him all the glory. What would I do? And Haman, foolishly blinded by his own self-love and hatred for everybody else, he says, ha ha, what could this be? It's all about me. So he starts talking about the crown. He's talking about royalty. And Haman understand, understands he means himself. And he says, aha, he wants my crown. So now he's even more suspicious of him. And then he tells him, go do everything to Mordechai, exactly what you said. Sends him off running to go to Mordechai. So he has to go running to Mordechai now and do all these things. And Haman has the most miserable day of his life. Esther closed down the bathhouses as we talked in the previous class. Haman himself has to become the bath attendant. Haman himself has to give the haircut. No, I'm not traveling Zelda. I'm just in the middle of teaching a class. But speaking to you on the radio is really important. So I'm going to interrupt. Well, I mean, the celebration of Purim is a one-day event. The story of Purim Zelda takes place over a number of years. And the specific commitment that the Jewish people made to God took place initially over a few days, which climaxed swiftly with Haman's being hung. But then there was a whole bunch of months in which amazing things unfolded. National renaissance, an amazing wave of return and tshuva, the Jewish people undid much of the spiritual damage that they had self-inflicted, the assimilation that had occurred in the decades prior. And by the time the story of Purim came around on the 13th day of Adar, Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, was as fiercely devoted to God and His Torah as they were when they received the Torah many centuries before. And that culminates then in the celebration of Purim. If, if you will, the actual miracle of Purim is a, an 11, it's an 11 month story, Zelda. It doesn't, it doesn't take place overnight. It doesn't take place quickly. It has incredible significance and by and large, Jewish holidays are celebrated for a day. You're right, it's a day with an enormous bandwidth. It impacts the entire year. Uh, it, it, biblically, Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be a day. Yom Kippur is a day. Sukkot is one day in the beginning, and Shemini Atzeret is one day at the end. It's only that outside of Eretz Yisrael, we need two days to download what takes one day in the Holy Land of Israel. The only Yom Tov, the only festival which is celebrated in kindred fashion for more than a day is Hanukkah. And that's celebrated in like fashion or in intensified fashion each and every day of Hanukkah as we continue to wax in light and, and holiness. But, you know, that's, that needs to be spoken of on Hanukkah time. The fact that Purim is just a day isn't really a question. My question is, why isn't this day more widely celebrated? Do people not realize and understand the power that's attributed and attached to the observances and celebration of this day? I, 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 I'm assuming they don't, Zelda. I guess that's my job and your job to promulgate this message. Fellow Jews, brothers and sisters, the day of Purim is an extraordinary day of holiness. It rivals even the day of Yom Kippur, which is Kippurim, like Purim. On Purim, Yom Kippurim, we have the opportunity to connect to God in a way which transcends what we call vehicles or conventions. Usually you have to take holiness and you have to kind of download it. You have to bring it into some kind of vessel. And that's why every holiday has specific mitzvot that are performed and a meal through which it's celebrated. Uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah has a, a chauffeur. The sukkah is, is, is dwelt in as we hold the lulav and etrog. And on these days, even on Rosh Hashanah, Day of Judgment, is ichlu mashmanim ushetum takim. We eat fine foods, we drink and toast ourselves with sweet and, 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 and wonderful drinks. And it's a, it's a time of celebration. And those celebrations actualize the holiness of the day. And when we eat and drink, we internalize the magic of the moment. On Yom Kippur, it can't be internalized in such fashion. And that's why we don't eat on Yom Kippur. 
And that's why the celebration is somewhat muted. It's not actualized in the most literal sense. And that's because Yom Kippur represents a holiness which is really beyond rhyme and reason, transcendent of convention or envelope. But the interesting thing is that Purim, of all the holidays, even though we eat and drink, this eating and drinking is actually beyond limitations. As the Gemara tells us, a person has to imbibe on Purim to the point that, it, that you transform, transform yourself into a, a, a place where rhyme and reason are no longer relevant. Every other holiday, Zelda, the eating and drinking has to be done in a limited fashion. In, in fact, the uh, Gemara tells us that the Bethan would actually have uh, kind of a, a security force that would go around and make sure that people didn't get too happy and didn't uh, veer off the path of propriety and decency. But on Purim, on the contrary, everybody's encouraged to kind of go beyond the rails and, and, and to leap beyond. And this is because Purim, sp spiritually speaking, is even more powerful than Kippurim. On Purim, we're able to download an energy that transcends even the holiness of Yom Kippur. And so Zelda, I know you'll be in Shul, but our hope and our prayer, I say our, I know you hope and pray for the same, is that all of our Jewish brothers and sisters will shake up the dust, rise from their slumber of assimilation, join us together in the Shuls across the GTA and beyond, and Be'ezrat Hashem, as we will re-embrace our faith and it express our loyalty and our commitment, dedication, and devotion to Hashem Elikei Yisrael, to God, that we will see Be'ezrat Hashem miracles and wonders this year, just as we've seen them in the days of Purim in antiquity. And hopefully this year Purim will herald a new world order and literally a full-on transformation of reality as we know it. And from the joy of Purim, we'll go into Simchat Olam, the eternal joy of redemption through the coming of Mashiach Bemheira, O be amen o speedily and in our days amen. Okay, let's go back to <laughs> studying the Megillah. And that was just off the top of your head, right? Whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what she's going to talk about, so I can't really plan for that. So we get a little insert. An extra, an extra now insert. Are we don't listen to Zelda, we can hear Because <laughs> they switched times, I mean, now it's at 11. All right, I guess uh, David will edit this part out. So going back to, to our point here, what, what were we saying right before? Just remind me, please. Yeah. And that man came in and he was goofy, he was miserable. Right. Yeah. So, so, so he, he thought everything was going to be like, like fantastic. He was planning this great day. And there they are waiting to see, Haman, how'd it go? And he comes in and they say, what happened? He says, don't even ask. And they look at him. What's going on? Because, you see, their advice sang Haman. Of course, Hashem sang Haman. But if you look at it, technically speaking, had he not gone to the king, nothing would have gone wrong. Here he went to the king. He said to the king, let's hang Mordechai. He didn't even get a chance to talk. And so he ended up being a bath attendant and then a royal crier. And now he finally comes home hours and hours and hours later after he had this wonderful plan. And he was going to come to the party joyous and jubilant, having rid himself of his arch enemy, Mordechai. And he comes home and he says, it was terrible, he says. It was awful. The whole plan was a disaster. And they go, what happened? And he says, ah, it just happened, whatever. It must have been a really bad day. I had bad luck today. And he tells them what happened. But when he finishes telling them what happened, he says, asher karahu, stuff happened. And they turn around and say, uh-oh, Haman, that's not stuff happening. If that happened, they said to him, if that happened, it's not just happenstance. And they said, Im hayehudim. If this is the Mordechai man that you're up against, if this is the way it's going, well, in that case, nafal tipal afanov, nafal, you're going you're gonna to fall before him. If it's Mordechai, hayehudim asher achilo if it's Mordechai he started to fall before, then everything is going to bottom out. Why did they say that? Why did they tell him, yeah, Haman, it just happened. High five, man. Let's have a drink. You'll feel better. Let's, let's, let's just get back in the program. Let's focus back on a strategy. Let's not get turned aside. Let's not get confused. Let's not allow this obfuscation to derail our plans. We know where we're going. We're going to destroy the Jewish people. Your enemies will be gone once and for all. It's just a temporary setback. They didn't say that. Why? So here, once we understand how and why 
the business of, of, of Haman had this interchange, this exchange began. Now, incidentally, according to another opinion, Amaris Halevi uh, says that they were not waiting to hear about the good news. That's unreasonable. They had to have heard what happened. How is it possible that he was going through the street with thousands of runners and everybody was talking about what happened? The whole Shushan was turned upside down and Haman's wife didn't hear about it. And Haman's wise people were too clueless. So you could say that they had stayed on the compound. They didn't know what was going on outside. They didn't have Facebook. There was no radio. So how were they supposed to know about it? But somehow you could imagine word would have gotten through to them. So the Manus Halevi maintains, he says, no, 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 no. They, what happened here was they all heard what happened. And therefore, they came to give him their condolences. They came to comfort Haman after what could only have been described as an absolute total debacle and disaster. They came to comfort him. Okay, well, if they came to comfort him, why didn't they comfort him? If they came to comfort him, there's a couple of nicer things they could have said than, oh, if it's Mordechai, or if he's Jewish, really if he's Jewish. Haman has been emphasizing time and again, it's Mordechai Hai Yehudi, it's Mordechai the Jew. Now they don't know if he's Jewish. So well, if he's Jewish, what if he's Jewish? He hates him because he's Jewish. That's the whole reason that he's been doing all this. And what kind of comfort is that? They said, you know what? You're finished, dude. If you started to fall before Mordechai, Nafal, Tipal, you'll fall into the lowest abyss. There's no way you're going to rise against him. Really? All of a sudden they became these big believers in the fortunes of the Jewish people? If they were so certain that the Jewish people were untouchable, why did they tell to Haman to begin with when he came with his plan? Why did they say it was a good idea? Why did they tell him, go hang Mordechai? Now they said, oh, but they're untouchable. Don't set up with them. This whole thing doesn't make any sense. Something changed. Something happened here. So for this we go to Rashi. Rashi says, Asher hachiloi salinfa. Whom you have begun to fall. And the Sivs Chacham says the emphasis here, there's like hachiloi salinfa. There's like multiple fallings. There's, there's not a bad day. There's not a falling out of, of, of plan. There is a domino effect. Something has started to unfold here. Why did they say that? Why were they so sure of that? So here, Rashi quotes the Gemara in Meseches Megillah on page 16, and he says, Amro, they said to him, Umazu nimshlo This nation is like the stars. But at the same time, they're also like Afar. They're also like in the metaphorized less soil. And so what does that mean? How could you be like the stars and like the soil? So the answer is there's different times. When we're on the ground, nobody falls to the ground like we do. But when we rise, nobody rises like we do either. In other words, statistics have nothing on us. We are a people who is unpredictable. The highs and lows of the Jewish people are unreplicated in the annals of human history. And the normative realities that apply to all nations the normative laws, they don't apply here. So off the charts. This is the highs and lows of Am Yisrael. And they said, Kishahim Yerdim, when they fall, oh, do they fall. Ad offer. We turn into ashes, as we have. However, Chashahim Oilim, but when they start to rise, then it's Oilim Ad Larakia. Then they smash glass ceilings. Then they reach the very highest atmosphere. They're with the stars. Ad till the outer reaches of space. Now, it's interesting to me because the Gemara has two ways of explaining this Gemara. The first thing the Gemara says is that when Haman came along and Haman said, you know, I had a very bad day. So, so they said to Haman, um, hayehudim. if it's from Zerah Yehudim, so then there's, there's, there's some trouble going on over here. But first, the Gemara asked the question. Initially, it says... He called his people who loved him, his friends, l'chalayavav. And then after l'chalayavav, it says chachamav. So the Gemara says, what is it? Karu le'aviv v'karu le'chachamav. He's called the lovers. They're called the wise people. Which were they? Were these the wise people or the friends? First he called his friends. Then he called his wise people. Are they one and the same? Why aren't they called wise friends? Why do they have two names in the same pasuk? And we never heard about wise people before. Before we only heard about friends. Now we're hearing about the verse starts with Haman talking to one group of people, but somebody else is answering. Something doesn't make sense here. So the Gemara says, Anybody who says something wise, it doesn't matter, Jewish, not Jewish, he's called wise. That's a very strange statement. Why shouldn't they be called wise if they say, 
So actually, the Chassam Sofer explains like this. He says, it doesn't mean say something wise. He says, anybody who says something wise from the Torah, that was eternal wisdom. Anybody who speaks about eternal wisdom, Torah wisdom, whether they're Jewish or not, they're called wise. Because really, Chacham means not just smart, not just intelligent, but a Chacham is connected to the notion of humility. And it's the ability to realize maybe I'm wrong, but to be open-minded, to be ready to learn, to say, I may have gotten this wrong, I'm not sure. I have to look, I have to look again. So anybody who says a Dvar Chacham, anybody who speaks with that kind of humility, whether the Jewish or not, is going to be called a Chacham. What was so wise about what they said? So the Gemara goes on to say, it says, Im mizera ha Yehudim, if it's from the seed of the Yehudim. So what does it mean from the seed of the Yehudim? He's been called Mordechai all along, Mordechai ha Yehudi. They said, listen, we have to find out where he's from because, you know, there's Jews and there's Jews. Let's find out his, his background. We need to go back and check which tribe is he from. Because truth be told, he was called Yehudi, but he wasn't from the tribe of Yehudi. He was from the tribe of Benyamin. And the Gemara advances this whole theory about different tribes. He said, if it's in the tribe of Yehuda, you're never going to win. Because Yehuda, it says, his, his hand is on the nape of his enemy, neck of his enemy. And if he's from the tribe of Menashe and Ephraim or Benyamin, you're also not going to be able to overcome him. Because it says, there's a pasuk in Tillam in, in, Psalm, in Psalm, chapter 80 that says that before Ephraim and Binyamin and Menashe, which is the children of Rachel, Hashem is going to provoke his anger, inside his anger. Rashi doesn't talk about all this. I find it very interesting. Rashi doesn't go with the whole business of Binyamin and Yehuda. Interestingly, the, the, the Targum says, in Mizara de Tzadikai of Mardachai, if he is from the righteous seed, meaning if he has ancestors who are Tzadikim, doesn't go into, the, the target doesn't go into this whole discussion. On a level of drush, we could say they got very wise all of a sudden and they began to know the difference of Yehuda, Binyamin, Menashe and Ephraim. On a level of pshat, to say that they understood the difference between one Jew and another Jew is a little bit of a reach. That's totally in the level of drash. Rashi doesn't quote that. He, sk- he skims over that. He does, Rashi, the, what Rashi does quote is the fact what the Gemara says in the world's Nafal people, the double folly. And there, Rashi says, Amru, they said, Lama, Shtein uh, Filus Lama, two times falling twice, that does bother Rashi. The Mizera HaYehudim is not such a question, from the seed of Yehudim. The seed of Yehudim means if he's from the seed of righteous Jews, that's good enough, he can follow the Targum. But here it says, Nafal Tipel, falling you shall fall, the double falling, what's this about? So he says, why are you so sure? It's like a domino effect. And therefore Rashi, the Gemara says, because Amru, they said him, Umazu Meshullah Afar. This is a wisdom that you don't have to be very learned in Torah. There are many wise people who observed that the Jewish people's fortunes are not natural. Mark Twain famously wrote something about this. President Adams, the second or third president of the United States, wrote something about the Jews. Many people wrote things. You can Google it. It's all these amazing things written about the Jews. People speak about the Jews and the Jews' fortune. There's something about the Jews that's otherworldly. Pascal maintained that the, the proof of God is the fact that the Jews exist. So this, you don't have to be a big lamdan, as I say, a big scholar of Torah literature to know the difference in Yehuda, Benyamin, Ephraim, which tribe he's from, how we find it out. He says, you're messing around with the Jews. He said, the Jews are a funny people. We planned this carefully. He did a whole scheme. He drew lots. It all seemed good. And now you're thinking something went wrong. But we can, the plan is in place. They said to him, no, 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 no. You have it wrong. It's a mistake, Haman. Do not make the mistake of thinking that this is Asher Karahu. Some stuff, some stuff happened. This is not a temporary diversion. Because this nation is like, unlike any other. When they fall, oh, they fall. They were ready for annihilation. But now something's changed. And if that happened to you, when you were going to hang Mordechai, at the last moment, there's such a stunning turnaround. It's not happenstance. You're wrong. Haman, you need to understand. The Jewish people are different. Their highs and lows are not seen anywhere else. This Rashi quotes. It was a very wise and astute observation that they made. So what happened to the lovers? What happened to the friends? First of all, the Dina Pshara, and um, it's also, I, I also found this, in the, the um, Svasema says this also and it develops it further. He says, you know, these people don't really have friends. These people in power. You think Haman really had people who loved him? They loved him if he was in power. The moment he's out of power, they stopped loving him already. Now they just got wise. 
So initially, when he told them the story and they wanted some sympathy, he thought he was talking to his friends. By now, they understood Haman's cooked goose. He's finished. They were no longer his oyavav. Zeresh, she already took a back seat. This was not. This is not the kind of group that she 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 felt a kindred sense to anymore. Now the chachamim came in. The love had waned, and all of a sudden they, they weren't blinded by love anymore. They weren't overwhelmed with positivity. They said, "Listen here, Haman." As your lawyer, I have to tell you. So your lawyer doesn't love you. He loves your money. He doesn't love you. He's just giving you advice. He said, as, as, as your lawyer, Haman, as your lawyers, as your strategists, we have to tell you it's time for a rebooting. You cannot simply continue with the same strategy. Something major has just taken place. It's, it's, there's a shift here. Maybe you can do this. If you can, it'll be sometime in the future. You got to shelve those plans. What happened here? What happened there? He says this is a nation that rises and falls in the way that the earth and the stars are metaphoric of. Let me share with you the words of the Medrash on the words of the Scripture in which God conveys to Yaakov, our father Jacob, the fortunes of the Jewish people, which clearly these wise people knew about. The pasuk is found in Genesis. In chapter 28, verse 15, it says, Vahayazaracha, your seed will be ka'afar ha'aretz. Your seed will be like the dust of the ground. Else we hear about the stars. But Hashem doesn't tell Yaakov about the stars. And a moment later he says, Ufaratzta. They'll burst forth. They'll powerfully explode. In other words, they'll be anywhere but the ground. The sky's the limit. So the Medrash Rabbah says, Sikusim nasen ha'kadosh baruch hu God gave measures. This is the yardstick of the Jewish people. If you want to measure their fortunes, if you want to know how things are going, here's the yardstick. Here's the methodology. It goes like this. Your progeny will be like the dust of the ground, says the Medrash. When they reach the lowest level, then when you think it's all gone, just like the moon, it disappears from the sky altogether. When you think it's all gone, think again. The Jewish people will not just slowly rebound. They will meteorically rebound. They will all of a sudden have a transformation of fortunes, the like of which has not been seen before. And really, we don't have to go so deep into Jewish history. If you look at the years of the Holocaust and the years that followed, you see the most remarkable shift in Jewish history. From the ashes of the crematorium to being able to rise and rebuild our nation in a way unprecedented since temple times in Eretz Yisrael and throughout the world. So this is the reality. He says when they fall, nobody is ashes. Nobody falls to the ground like we fall. But, but at that moment when they fall so low, you should know they're going to rebound. Now with this, if you use this medrash, you could take the Gemara even further. Here the wise people said, when they fall, they fall. When they rise, they rise. Haman, the jig is up. But perhaps from this medrash, you could take it even further and say they saw that Mordechai fell to the lowest level. Mordechai was about to be killed. In fact, if you remember in the previous classes, I told you when Haman entered the Beit Medrash where Mordechai was sitting, for the first time Mordechai is afraid. He said, the jig is up. The noose is on my neck. Always Mordechai was strong, didn't bow, didn't budge. When Haman walked in that day, he said it's over. And the day, the moment that Mordechai thought all is gone, that's where everything turned around all of a sudden. That's where Haman says, no, no, no. It's not what you think. I'm not, I'm not here to harm you. On the contrary, I need to give you a bath. I need to make sure your hair is cut. I need to dress you in royal clothes. Everything changes then. And, and, and the Rebbe once explained in that medrash, she said, that what is the meaning of Yagiyah Zeracha Adafara Oretz? That the nation reaches the lowest level. He says, this is not just a, a narrative of the f- of failures and fortunes of the Jewish people. But on the contrary, he says, the message to the Jewish people is that when we reach a level of spiritual humility, because that's what offer, that's what dust or soil is metaphoric of, the notion of, of, of u- extreme humility is typified in the verse we say every day in Ashman Esrei, three times you say, V'nafshi ka'afar la let my soul be like dust. When the Jewish people were humbled before God when they felt like dust before Hashem. And that's what happened in these days before. 
going back many a class ago, you remember I talked about Mordechai wearing torn clothes, screaming in the streets? Why was he doing that? Because he wanted to convey to the people that were in big trouble. It's not business as usual. The first time since Yetzirah Mitzrayim, the first time since the Jewish people left the land of Egypt, no matzah was eaten on the Seder night. A darker time you couldn't have. So humbled were they. When the Jewish people humbled themselves before Hashem, when they stopped saying, we have might, we have power, we have, we have political connections, we have wherewithal and ability, diplomacy is on our side. When they didn't say that, when instead they put on sackcloth, and instead they put on ashes instead of putting on yomtiv clothes, when instead of celebrating and making believe everything was fine, they humbled themselves before Hashem. Ah, they come to offer. When they came to that kind of humility, now the fortunes have changed. They said to Haman, something's gone on here. Something has shifted. Something has changed. These are not the people that we were originally scheming against. I'll take you back many, many classes ago. If you remember, when we talked about the great feast that Achashverosh made, it was designed to induce sin. It was designed to create debauchery. It was very carefully choreographed to bring out the most immoral and worst impulses within the people. He specially made sure the men and women wouldn't be far from each other. This should be an endless amount of alcohol. Somehow there should eventually be a spillover. And the plan was to initially give them kosher food so they would be disarmed, but the kosher food would be lousy. And if you want really good food, you have to go on the other side, the other buffet. And they serve kosher wine, but who wants to drink Manischewitz when there's delicious Bordeaux? And so slowly but surely, they got, intact, they got drawn into sin. This was Achashverosh's plan. And Haman was in from the get-go. And they watched the people sin and they watched the people fall into this downward spiral of assimilation and, 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 and debauchery and immorality. And they said, ah, now we got them. Because when they sin, Hashem is no longer with them. And everything was going great. Haman was going higher and higher, waxing more powerful. Everything seemed inevitable. And at that moment, all of a sudden, the Jewish people did tshuva. And when we came down to the Hoya Zarach Kafara Oretz, as the Rebbe explains it, not only that we were demoted to the lowest level, we brought ourselves to the greatest humility before Hashem, we humbled ourselves before Hashem and did tshuva. Then comes the great salvation. The wise people understood this. They understood that the Jewish people's fortune are unlike any other, as the Gemara says. But they understood furthermore, as the Rebbe says, they understood here that something major had just unfolded. Nothing happens with the Jewish people. In general, nothing happens. But when it comes to the Jewish people, nothing just happens. Everything is the hand of Hashem. That's the story of Purim, the hidden miracles. So when they turned around to Haman, Haman said, eh, it was a bad day. We don't have to re-strategize. All of a sudden they said, no, 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 Haman, you make a big mistake. This is not just a bad day. And here the Mepharshim point out the reason that Zeresh was there in the beginning, Zeresh was there to comfort, and the lovers were there to tell Haman how fantastic he was. And when they realized what's going on, they basically shrank into the background. And the only one willing to speak now was the lawyers. The only one were people that paid, the, the paid guns. And they said, how many we got some bad news for you? It's not going to work out. This is, this is not Asher Karahu. This didn't just happen. And Zeresh backed them up and she said, yeah, hey man, it's not going to go. Remember, this is a Jewish story. If this is a Jewish story and you keep saying it's Mordechai HaYehudi, Asher Achilei Salimful, that you had this terrible fall today, it's not just today. It doesn't work that way. When they start to rise, there's no stopping them. Nafel Tipa Lefanov, you're going to continue to fall. And therefore, what should you do? They didn't say this to make him feel bad. They're giving him good advice. They said, Haman, we need to recalibrate. Whatever we said before didn't work. And Haman like accused them. He said, I don't want to hear what my wife has to say. Last time she spoke, look where I ended up. Now he blamed his wife. He blamed his lovers. He said, you told me to build a gallows. Look where that took me. So the wise people stepped in. Or well, they wisened up and they said, yeah, we did say that. But we didn't realize that something had gone wrong. But here's where you're mistaken. It's not an Asher Karohu. This is not a happenstance business. Now we are seeing a major shift. And because we're seeing the major shift, therefore, we have to now, so to speak, recalibrate everything. In the words of the um, Yosef Lekach, the Inyankiv, they said, Shoska Zeresh. Zeresh was silent. The Oyhav, they didn't want to speak. Who spoke first now? The Chachamim. 
Not like the first time where it says, Zeresh Here it says, Only after Zeresh came in. And they gave him an idea. And what was their idea? They said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, is not allowing this to unfold. We have to come up with a new strategy. But God interrupted them. They would have had a good strategy. What was their strategy? The Vilna Gaon puts it so beautifully. He says, you got to realize, he said, once they start rising, it's over. And he says, Haman, others bring down, came over and he said to them, look in the stars, check out my astrology, find out what's gone wrong. And it says, they, it's, it's brought down, the Manus Halevi says he had 365 advisors for each day of the year. Each one was an expert in his part of the astrology. And they took a look at the stars and they said, Haman, the stars don't help here. Ain mazali so." The Jewish people's fortunes are not really played out like that. Rest like everybody else. The horoscope doesn't affect him. And that's what the Vilna Gaon says over here. He says, Im Azali Yisrael, the Gemara tells us. And therefore, the horoscope will not affect them. What was their advice to him? They gave him good advice. They didn't just pour salt in his wounds. The Vilna Gaon says, Amru Yister Esa Eitz. Get rid of the gallows. The gallows looks really bad now. It's an eyesore. Everybody knows what you're about to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work against you. Smash it, break it. Yasa imeshalom. Make peace with Mordechai. Just make peace with him. Tell him I made a mistake. I didn't realize, and 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 say, let's renegotiate. I don't want to harm your people. And Haman said, No, Mikra. It just happened. It's, we're going to keep doing this. And they said, Wrong. It didn't just happen. It's over. Recalibrate. Go back to the drawing board. We need a new strategy. So they're arguing about a new strategy. And he could have had a good strategy. What happened in the middle of this argument while they're trying to hammer at a strategy and they're talking? That takes it to verse 14. They're talking to Haman and saying, Haman, you got to do it differently. Plan A is a failure. Let's do plan B. Some of the Mepharshim suggest, they said to Haman, we'll get the Jewish people to assimilate again. Don't worry, this tshuva is not going to last. We know the Jews. But now they're in God's favor. Now is not a good time. Make peace with the Jews. Make peace with Mordechai. Become their friend again. Don't worry, he says. What we don't accomplish by persecuting them, we can accomplish through friendship. And that's the story of our times. More assimilation in the last 70 years, Zachman al Tzan, than in thousands of years before. Why? Because everybody's our friend. They're killing us with kindness. They said to Haman, kill him with kindness. Start to re-embrace the Jews again. Let's get into marriage fashionable again. Let's get them to start sinning again. Then we'll do what we have to do. Next time we'll be more careful. Make sure nobody knows about it so they can't do tshuva. So oide medabrim, they're telling him what to do. Dismantle the gallows. Make peace. And all of a sudden, Hashem interrupts. The Vilna Gaon says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu interrupted and he says, He could have done all these things. He could have done all these things. However, it was a sibum Eis Hashem. That as they're busy arguing, before they can hammer out a strategy, the royal officers came and they said, Haman, what? Now, we're in the middle of talking, we're strategizing. What strategize? The king is waiting for you. He had no time. So they never worked at a strategy. Haman could have gotten himself out of this pickle. But now HaKadosh Baruch Hu is pulling the strings openly and that's why, as they're strategizing, this is not a, a condolence session. This is a dangerous strategy. This is in the, the eagle's nest. The Nazis are planning the next move. And at that time, Hashem comes in, interrupts the planning, and Haman is yanked out. So his plans never come to anything. And he heads off for his final dinner. Because he'll be hanging in a very short amount of time. That's the connection of verse 13 to verse 14. Now it makes so much sense. It's, it's uh, telling and compelling. There's a fascinating commentary Imam Loyes brings down about whose order was this? Who ordered... Who ordered Haman to come immediately? And he maintains this was Esther's order. Why was it Esther's order? He says the Dina Pashra, the Maimon Mordechai say, that Haman, part of his strategy was, maybe we should lead a rebellion against the king. Haman said, I'm going to go into all my sons. His sons were actually prime ministers, or governors of different provinces. He was going to go call a secret meeting of his sons, and they were going to plot the overthrow of Ahasuerus, lead a mass rebellion. They all had little mercenary armies. They all had the ability. And Esther realized that was going to happen. 
she realized that Haman is going re- to understand that everything, the bottom, the t- things had bottomed out. And therefore, she knew she had to act swiftly. So here, Esther, with her brilliant political acumen, once again saves the day. Immediately sends the officers, says, the party is now. There's one guest and he's not arrived. He hasn't arrived yet. So they come before Haman could have any kind of chance to plot his next move and to figure out how to overcome the current obstacle. Esther makes sure that he's dragged right in. The commentaries also tell us that Haman realized that it was not just it was before in the Nafel people there was a redundancy. The Al Sheikh says there was two fallings over here. The Al Sheikh says that they, he realized the advisors realized that he had fallen before Esther as well. That's the Nafel people. There's going to be a double fall. You're going to have a falling out with Esther. Esther never told anybody what her nation is, so there was always a suspicion she might be Jewish. But nobody could. How could it be? How could a Jew be so beautiful? How could a Jew be so great? It couldn't be a Jew. But there's a suspicion. They knew there was a relationship with Mordechai and Esther. So the, the, the wise people said to Haman, you're clearly, Esther's not on your side. How did they know this? They knew this, says the al Sheikh, and Megillus Sarim says, because who shut down all the bathhouses? It was by the royal edict of the queen. Who shut down the barbershops? Esther did. They, they quickly went and found out what happened, which forced Haman to be the barber and Haman to be the bath attendant. They said, Esther's in on this. But really, Esther wasn't. She didn't know how things were going to unfold. But as soon as she got the information, she immediately made sure to do this. She was on top of her game. Brilliant, brilliant mastermind of everything is Esther, not Mordechai. So Esther brilliantly closes down all these things, makes sure the city's closed down so the people will be in the streets to see the parade. And they said, if she's in on this, you're falling out, you're falling out with Esther. You need to make peace with Esther too. It must be that Esther's Jewish. And that's the redundancy over here. So Haman is now planning to somehow, he has to make things right with Esther and make things right with Mordechai. He's got a number of options, right? He's just going to strategize. How do we do this? Do we make friends with Mordechai? That's the Vilna Goyen's approach. He says that, that was the plan. The Manus Levi says, no, we're going to lead a rebellion against him. There's going to be a move. What do we do now? Whatever was, isn't. So now we have to plan the next move. And as they're planning the next move, and as Haman is going to be in that situation, all of a sudden, Hashem para- parachutes in these eunuchs, these royal officers, and they said, by Avilu, this second. And here it gets really cool, because Haman, in his state of dishevelment, he never even took a shower. Do you remember what he had a shower of? The chamber pot. He stinks to the high heavens. He's in miserable. He's yelling and screaming at his wife, at his friends, who are not his friends anymore, at his advisors. His lawyers are screaming at him. There's total chaos. In the meantime, Oide Medabrim, the Manas Alevi says, guess what happened? The Sarisim heard this conversation. They overheard. Because how else did Charvona know? Charvona steps in when Nachashverosh has an absolute fit and he storms out into the garden and he sees Haman lying on Mordechai begging for his life. And he says, did you come to seduce the queen also? And then Charvona says, not only this, he built a gallows to hang the friend of the king Mordechai. How did he know that? How did he know? So Chavona was in on this whole thing. He realized because he overheard and he knew that Haman was planning to dismantle the gallows but didn't get to dismantle the gallows. And so he right away moved in with the information they picked up. So they were still speaking. The royal officers heard this whole strategy session. Haman got yanked out. He comes in a state of disorient, is totally disoriented. He's disheveled. He stinks. He doesn't have his act together. He's a brilliant operator on a good day. But today is not a good day. His same fraud is blown. He's not the cool, calm, collected Haman. There's no Vayis Apak happening on this day. Haman is totally discombobulated. And it's interesting that it says, Vayavilu, but it was just Lahavi. Once they got going, the officers relented. They left Haman alone. They didn't have to anymore. Everything had happened as it should. The Gemara says, What does it mean, Melamed? This teaches us, Shehevi'i they brought him with a state of anxiety, in a state of, 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 of you know, pushing him and, 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 and demanding of him to go. So Haman came disoriented, stinking. And when he sat down at the party, he wasn't able to right now figure out what move is next and what to say and how to go. He was lost. He was a lost man. He was totally freaked out. And he stank. And he felt miserable about his body odor and how he smelled. So in this kind of situation, that's what parachutes us now into verse, chapter 7.
Now you know the rest of the story. Now you understand how Haman came, he sought advice, he began to strategize, and he got interrupted in the strategy session, and there they go straight into the, the party. Lahavi, they came to bring Haman, and with this, chapter 6 concludes, and the stage is set for Haman's downfall, which will be happening very swiftly. Now imagine Achashverosh comes, and he sees who comes, how does Haman come to the party? Stinking. He says, he disrespects me. Who shoppers up at a royal ball? He can't take a shower first. So Achashverosh, the ever suspicious man, thinking that everybody's out to get him, thinks that this was Haman's way, he came late to the party, and he came to shovel to the party. I have a relative who has a point of, he's a stickler for time. He always comes on time. And he told me, sometimes I come late. I said, you come late sometimes? He says, when I'm angry at somebody, I come late. I make a point. They know. They know if I came late, I was angry. <laughs> and if he says, so I guess that's, how, that's his gig. If I come late, then I'm just being myself. But I guess. <laughs> so Haman is not punctual. When you're the only guest, it's a good idea to show up on time. Especially if the hosts are the queen and the king. The queen and the king are waiting. Esther sitting there. Achashverosh is not happy. He's not in a good mood. He's, he's suspicious of his own wife, thinking maybe she's plotting behind him. And it's like, hello? Is dinner yet? Esther says, well, we're just waiting for our guest. And she smiles sweetly. And Achashverosh is raging inside. And Haman walks in, disheveled, not focused, late. And you can only imagine what Achashverosh is thinking now. He's further dishonoring me. He, he's dissing me. That's how he shows up to my party not knowing the whole background of what has gone on. And this, as we say, is the crowning climax of the story. And this, uh, so to speak, wonderful situation where Haman is poised for disaster, this is how chapter 7 will open. Uh, Rabbi, didn't you say that when Esther threw the... Little when she threw the, the chamber... No, Esther didn't throw it. Haman's daughter threw it. Because mm -hmm. then I misunderstood everything because I thought you said when Esther threw the, the, excre the excrement, she, then she jumped off the boat. Esther didn't she jump. Down. Haman's daughter. Wow. Haman's do and that's, and that, and that's oh. like add to compound everything else. He's still in mourning. He never had a chance to mourn for his daughter. Oh. Oh, he I still has... He has a daughter who killed herself and there wasn't even a funeral yet. You can imagine what Haman's feeling like. His entire life has, seems to have gone up in smoke, literally, over a few hours. His daughter is dead and hasn't yet been buried, and he's expected to show up and look happy at a royal party because Achashverosh doesn't know what happened, and he's not going to tell them what happened. Yeah. So this is such a stunning turnaround. This, this is actually mind-boggling. So people say, where's the miracles in the story of Purim? <laughs> That's, the miracles are right here. It looks like a natural story, but this is a soap opera like nobody could ever have written. This is such, so stunning, so extraordinary, so amazing. Now we're going from Ophir. Now we're heading for the stars. And this is now mid-trajectory. We stop chapter 6, and we get ready for the next scene. Haman enters the party to be continued. So Haman had all the sons and one daughter.